Book Eight, Chapters One through Six, Volume One, of Le Morte d'Arthur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Catherine Fitz. Le Morte d'Arthur, Volume One, by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book Eight, Chapters One through Six. Chapter One. It was a king that hight Meliodas, and he was lord and king of the country of Leonis. And this Meliodas was a likely knight, as was any that time living. And by fortune he wedded King Mark's sister of Cornwall, and she was called Elizabeth, that was called both good and fair. And at that time King Arthur reigned, and he was whole king of England, Wales, and Scotland, and of many other realms. Howbeit there were many kings that were lords of many countries. But all they held their lands of King Arthur. For in Wales were two kings, and in the north were many kings, and in Cornwall and in the west were two kings. Also in Ireland were two or three kings, and all were under the obeisance of King Arthur. So was the King of France, and the King of Brittany, and all the lordships unto Rome. So when this King Meliodas had been with his wife, within a while she waxed great with child, and she was a full meek lady, and well she loved her lord and he her again, so there was great joy betwixt them. Then there was a lady in that country that had loved King Meliodas long, and by no means she could never get his love. Therefore she let ordain upon a day, as King Meliodas rode a-hunting, for he was a great chaser, and thereby an enchantment she made him chase and hart by himself alone, till that he came to an old castle, and there anon he was taken prisoner by that lady that him loved." When Elizabeth, King Meliodas' wife, missed her lord, and she was nigh out of her wit, and also as great with child as she was, she took a gentlewoman with her, and ran into the forest to seek her lord. And when she was far in the forest she might know further, for she began to travail fast of her child. And she had many grimly throes, her gentlewoman helped her all that she might, and so by miracle of Our Lady of Heaven she was delivered with great pains. But she had taken such cold for the default of help that deep draughts of death took her, that she must need die and depart out of this world. There was none other boat. And when this Queen Elizabeth saw that there was no other boat, then she made great dole, and said unto her gentlewoman, When ye see my lord King Meliodas, recommend me unto him, and tell him what pains I endure here for his love, and how I must die here for his sake for default of good help. And let him wit that I am full sorry to depart out of this world from him. Therefore pray him to be friend to my soul. Now let me see my little child, for whom I have had all this sorrow. And when she saw him, she said thus, Ah, my little son, thou hast murdered thy mother, and therefore I suppose that thou art a murderer so young, thou art full likely to be a manly man in thine age. And because I shall die of the birth of thee, I charge thee, gentlewoman, that thou pray my lord, King Meliodas, that when he is christened, let call him Tristram, that is as much to say as a sorrowful birth. And therewith this queen gave up the ghost and died. Then the gentlewoman laid her under an umber of a great tree, and then she lapped the child as well as she might for cold. Right so there came the barons, following after the queen, and when they saw that she was dead, and understood none other but the king was destroyed, then certain of them would have slain the child, because they would have been lords of the country of Leonis. Chapter 2 But then through the fair speech of the gentlewoman, and by the means that she made, the most part of the barons would not assent thereto, and then they let carry home the dead queen, and much dole was made for her. Then this meanwhile Merlin delivered King Meliodas out of prison, on the morn after his queen was dead. And so when the king was came home, the most part of his barons made great joy, but the sorrow that the king made for his queen that might no tongue tell. So then the king let inter her richly, and after he let christen his child as his wife had commanded afore her death. And then he let call him Tristram, the sorrowful-born child. Then the king Meliodas endured seven years without a wife, and all this time Tristram was nourished well. Then it befell that king Meliodas wedded king Howell's daughter of Brittany, and anon she had children of king Meliodas. Then she was heavy and wroth that her children should not rejoice the country of Leonis. Wherefore this queen ordained for to poison young Tristram. So she let poison be put in a piece of silver in the chamber, whereas Tristram and her children were together, 
unto that intent that when Tristram was thirsty he should drink that drink. And so it fell upon a day, the queen's son, as he was in that chamber, espied the piece with the poison, and he weaned it had been good drink, and because the child was thirsty he took the piece with poison and drank freely, and therewithal suddenly the child brassed and was dead. When the queen of Meliodas wist of the death of her son, wit ye well that she was heavy, but yet the king understood nothing of her treason. Notwithstanding, the queen would not leave this, but eft she let ordain more poison, and put it in a piece. And by fortune, King Meliodas, her husband, found the piece with wine where was the poison. And he that was much thirsty took the piece for to drink thereout. And as he would have drunken thereof, the queen espied him, and then she ran unto him, and pulled the piece from him suddenly. The king marvelled why she did so, and remembered him how her son was suddenly slain with poison. And then he took her by the hand, and said, Thou false traitress, thou shalt tell me what manner of drink this is, or else I shall slay thee. And therewith he pulled out his sword, and swore a great oath that he should slay her, but if she told him truth. Ah, mercy, my lord, said she, and I shall tell you all. And then she told him why she would have slain Tristram, because her children should rejoice his land. Well, said King Meliodas, and therefore shall ye have the law. And so she was condemned by the assent of the barons to be burned. And then was there made a great fire, and right as she was at the fire to take her execution, young Tristram kneeled afore King Meliodas, and besought him to give him a boon. I will well, said the king again. Then said young Tristram, Give me the life of their queen, my stepmother. That is unrightfully asked, said King Meliodas, for thou art of right to hate her, for she would have slain thee with that poison, and she might have had her will. And for thy sake most is my cause that she should die. Sir, said Tristram, as for that, I beseech you of your mercy that you will forgive it her, and as for my part, God forgive it her, and I do. And so much it liked your highness to grant me my boon, for God's love I require you, hold your promise. Sith and it is so, said the king, I will that ye have her life. Then said the king, I give her to you, and go ye to the fire and take her, and do with her what ye will. So Sir Tristram went to the fire, and by the commandment of the king delivered her from the death. But after that King Meliodas would never have ado with her, as at bed and board. But by the good means of young Tristram he made the king and her accorded. But then the king would not suffer young Tristram to abide no longer in his court. CHAPTER Three, And then he let ordain a gentleman that was well learned and taught. His name was Governail, and then he sent young Tristram with Governail into France to learn the language, and nurture, and deeds of arms. And there was Tristram more than seven years. And then, when he well could speak the language, and had learned all that he might learn in that country, then he came home to his father, King Meliodas, again. And so Tristram learned to be a harper, passing all other that there was none such called in no country, and so on harping and on instruments of music he applied him in his youth for to learn. And after, as he grew in might and strength, he laboured ever in hunting and in hawking, so that never gentleman more that ever we read of. And as the book saith, he began good measures of blowing of beasts of venery, and beasts of chase, and all manner of vermin, and all these terms we have yet of hawking and hunting and therefore the book of venery, of hawking, and hunting, is called the book of Sir Tristram. Wherefore, as me seemeth, all gentlemen that bear old arms ought of right to honour Sir Tristram, for the goodly terms that gentlemen have and use, and shall to the day of doom, that thereby, in a manner all men of worship may dissever a gentleman from a yeoman, and from a yeoman a villain. For he that gentle is will draw him unto gentle tatches, and follow the customs of noble gentlemen." Thus Sir Tristram endured in Cornwall, until he was big and strong, of the age of eighteen years. And then the king Meliodas had great joy of Sir Tristram, and so had the queen, his wife. For ever after in her life, because Sir Tristram saved her from the fire, she did never hate him more after, but loved him ever after, and gave Tristram many great gifts. For every estate loved him, where that he went. CHAPTER Four. Then it befell that King Anguish of Ireland sent unto King Mark of Cornwall for his truage, that Cornwall had paid many winters. And all that time King Mark was behind of the truage for seven years. And King Mark and his barons gave unto the messenger of Ireland these words in answer, that they would none pay, 
and bade the messenger go unto his king Anguish, and tell him, We will pay him no truage, but tell your lord, and he will always have truage of us at Cornwall. Bid him send a trusty knight of his land, that will fight for his right, and we shall find another for to defend our right. With this answers the messengers departed into Ireland. And when King Anguish understood the answer of the messengers, he was wonderly wroth. And then he called unto him Sir Marhaus, the good knight, that was nobly proved, and a knight of the table round. And this Marhaus was brother unto the Queen of Ireland. Then the king said thus, Fair brother, Sir Marhaus, I pray you go into Cornwall for my sake, and do battle for our truage that of right we ought to have. And whatsoever you spend, ye shall have sufficiently, more than ye shall need. Sir, said Marhaus, wit ye well that I shall not be loath to do battle in the right of you and your land with the best knight of the table round. For I know them, for the most part, what be their deeds. And for to advance my deeds, and to increase my worship, I will right gladly go unto this journey for our right. So in all haste there was made purveyance for Sir Marhaus, and he had all things that to him needed. And so he departed out of Ireland, and arrived up in Cornwall even fast by the castle of Tintagel. And when King Mark understood that he was there arrived to fight for Ireland, then made King Mark great sorrow when he understood that the good and noble knight Sir Marhaus was come. For they knew no knight that durst have ado with him. For at that time Sir Marhaus was called one of the famousest and renowned knights of the world. And thus Sir Marhaus abode in the sea, and every day he sent unto King Mark for to pay the truage that was behind of seven year, other else to find a knight to fight with him for the truage. This manner of message Sir Marhaus sent daily unto King Mark. Then they of Cornwall let make cries in every place, that what knight would fight for to save the truage of Cornwall, he should be rewarded so that he should fare the better term of his life. Then some of the barons said to King Mark, and counselled him to send to the court of King Arthur, for to seek Sir Launcelot du Lake, that was at that time named for the marvellest knight of all the world. Then there were some other barons that counselled the king not to do so, and said that it was labour in vain, because Sir Marhaus was a knight of the round table. Therefore any of them will be loath to have ado with other. But if it were any knight at his own request would fight disguised and unknown. So the king and all his barons assented that it was no boat to seek any knight of the round table. This meanwhile came the language and the noises unto King Meliodas, how that Sir Marhaus abode battle fast by Tintagel, and how King Mark could find no manner of knight to fight for him. When young Tristram heard of this, he was wroth, and sore ashamed that there durst no knight in Cornwall to have ado with Sir Marhaus of Ireland. CHAPTER V. Therewithal Tristram went unto his father, King Meliodas, and asked him counsel what was best to do for to recover Cornwall from Truage. For, as me seemeth, said Sir Tristram, it were shame that Sir Marhaus, the Queen's brother of Ireland, should go away unless that he were foughten withal. As for that, said King Meliodas, wit ye well, son Tristram, that Sir Marhaus is called one of the best knights of the world, and knight of the table round, and therefore I know no knight in this country that is able to match with him. Alas, said Sir Tristram, that I am not made knight, and if Sir Marhaus should thus depart into Ireland, God let me never have worship, and I were made knight, I should match him. And, sir, said Tristram, I pray you, give me leave to ride to King Mark, and so ye not be displeased, if King Mark will I be made knight. I will well, said King Meliodas, that ye be ruled as your courage will rule you. Then Sir Tristram thanked his father much, and then he made him ready to ride into Cornwall. In the meanwhile there came a messenger with letters of love from F King Faramon of France's daughter unto Sir Tristram. There were full piteous letters, and in them were written many complaints of love. But Sir Tristram had no joy of her letters, nor regard unto her. Also she sent him a little brachet that was passing fair. But when the king's daughter understood that Sir Tristram would not love her, as the book saith, she died for sorrow. And then the same squire that brought the letter and the brachet came again unto Sir Tristram, as ye shall after hear in the tale. So this young Sir Tristram wrote unto his eam, King Mark of Cornwall. And when he came there, he heard say that there would no knight fight with Sir Marhaus. Then yede Sir Tristram unto his eam, and said, Sir, 
if ye will give me the order of knighthood, I will do battle with Sir Marhaus. What are ye, said the king, and from whence be ye come? Sir, said Tristram, I come from King Meliodas, that wedded your sister, and a gentleman wit ye well I am. King Mark beheld Sir Tristram, and saw that he was but a young man of age, but he was passingly well made and big. Fair sir, said the king, what is your name, and where were ye born? Sir, said he again, my name is Tristram, and in the country of Leonis I was born. Ye say well, said the king, and if ye will do this battle I shall make you knight. Therefore I come to you, said Sir Tristram, and for no other cause. But then King Mark made him knight, and therewithal, anon as he had made him knight, he sent a messenger unto Sir Marhaus with letters that said that he had found a young knight, ready for to take the battle to his uttermost. It may well be, said Sir Marhaus, but tell King Mark I will not fight with no knight, but he be of blood royal, that is to say, other king's son, other queen's son, born of a prince or princess. When King Mark understood that, he sent for Sir Tristram de Leonis, and told him what was the answer of Sir Marhaus. Then said Sir Tristram, Sithen that he say so, let him wit that I am come of father's side and mother's side, of his noble blood as he is. For, sir, now ye shall know that I am King Meliodas' son, born of your own sister, Dame Elizabeth, that died in the forest in the birth of me. O oh, Jesu, said King Mark, ye are welcome, fair nephew, to me. Then in all the haste the king let horse Sir Tristram, and armed him in the best manner that might be had or gotten for gold or silver. And then King Mark sent unto Sir Marhaus, and did to him wit that a better-born man than he was himself should fight with him, and his name is Sir Tristram de Milionis, gotten of King Meliodas, and born of King Mark's sister. Then was Sir Marhaus glad and bleeth that he should fight with such a gentleman. And so by the assent of King Mark, and of Sir Marhaus, they let ordained that they should fight within an island, nigh Sir Marhaus' ships. And so was Sir Tristram put into a vessel, both his horse and he, and all that to him longed both for his body and for his horse. Sir Tristram lacked nothing. And when King Mark and his barons of Cornwall beheld how young Sir Tristram departed, with such a carriage, to fight for the right of Cornwall, there was neither man nor woman of worship, but they wept to see and understand so young a knight to jeopardy himself for their right. CHAPTER six. So, to shorten this tale, when Sir Tristram was arrived within the island, he looked to the farther side, and there he saw at anchor six ships nigh to the land, and under the shadow of the ships upon the land there hoved the noble knight, Sir Marhaus of Ireland. Then Sir Tristram commanded his servant, Gouvernail, to bring his horse to the land, and dress his harness at all manner of rites. And then, when he had done so, he mounted upon his horse, and when he was in his saddle well apparelled, and his shield dressed upon his shoulder, Tristram asked Gouvernail, Where is this knight that I shall have ado withal? Sir, said Gouvernail, see ye him not? I weened he had seen him. Yonder he hoveth under the umber of his ships on horseback, with his spear in his hand, and his shield upon his shoulder. That is truth, said the noble knight, Sir Tristram. Now I see him well enough. Then he commanded his servant, Gouvernail, to go to his vessel again, and commend me unto mine eme, King Mark, and pray him, if that I be slain in this battle, for to inter my body as him seemed best. And as for me, let him wit that I will never yield me for cowardice, and if I be slain and flee not, then they have lost no truage for me. And if so be that I flee or yield me as recreant, bid mine eme never to bury me in Christian burials. And upon thy life, said Sir Tristram to Gouvernail, come thou not nigh this island till that thou see me overcome or slain, or else that I win yonder knight. So either departed from other, sore weeping. End of Book Eight, Chapters One through Six. Recording by Catherine Fitz, Davis, California.